Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Loving the Game. And today, I am very honored to have a special guest with me, um, someone that has stepped big uh, or has left big uh, marks on Loftus and around the world. Um, just to mention a few things, records that he's got. Most points in a Curry Cup final, which still stands today. Um, 26 points in his first ever Curry Cup final. He's got the um, in the Curry Cup as well. Joint most penalties in a Curry Cup league match, which is nine. Um, in Super Rugby, well, mostly Super 14, it was. He's got um, joint joint most penalties, which is eight, and also the most conversions in a Super 14 match, 11. I'm talking about none other than Derek Hogart. Um, someone that I admired as a um, throughout his playing career, and um, I'm very, very honoured to have Derek with me today. Derek, thank you so much for joining me. It is such an honour. Jock, thank you so much. It's uh, it's my privilege. Um, thanks for thinking of me, and uh, hopefully we can uh, have a good conversation, and everybody will enjoy it. Thanks, um, Derek. Um, just to start things off quickly, I know we're all sitting in lockdown, but under normal circumstances, what are you up to these days, if I may ask? My friend, that's a very good question. I'm actually trying to grow up, which for a rugby player is not an easy thing to do. Um, I think what I've, we, we read a lot about it um, in the past, couple, especially with the lockdown, where there's uh, people has come out and say that the transition for rugby players are very tough, uh, especially mm. when you're used to playing since you were 18 years old and all you know is rugby and making that transition into to the real life is not an easy one but um i'm both lucky enough with good friends at virtual productions which you will know a lot of uh, broadcasting and um they do sound and lighting and striking so basically when everybody's done partying then we need to strike down so i'm on the different side of uh, the spectrum now but um yeah, and obviously I do a little bit. Of, I did do a, a little bit of work for Super Sports, which I really enjoy, and that's something that I really want to pursue as well to to stay in TV and broadcasting. Thanks, man, um, Derek. So let's let's start off at the beginning. Um, what or who introduced you to the game, and you know, gave you? I won't say gave you your first ball, but you had something in you that said, "I like this game, and I want to watch it." and maybe one day become a player? Yeah, I think um, I think it all started at Paketberg, uh, which is the primary school. Um, and at that stage, I didn't even have a rugby ball. So we used a two-litre Coke bottle to, to play, and we all always used to make the, the grass wet so that we can slide. So most of the time, my grandmother and father went happy with me at all um and uh, we went to we went to a game i was i really enjoyed cricket at school as well and when you get to a grade 11 12 um you need to make a decision which one you will pursue and we went to a game at newlands um and all the stormers at that stage came walking out and they all had this the black suit on they looked like men in black so and then i thought to myself it's between cricket and rugby with there's 60,000 people, it will be nice to, to play in front of him. And 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 really growing up with with the tradition that, that I did and the rugby mad country, I think every weekend we watch rugby. Um, and, and, and it was one of those, those crazy things. Um, my last game at school was against Oakdale, Bullen Lagba against Oakdale, and the next year it was a Curry Cup final. So, and then I realized how, how special it was and I, I I spoke to our headmaster um, and he said, he phoned me and he just reminded me of that. And and I just realized that probably a year ago, I was still watching the Curry Cup final and, and really looking up to all those guys. And then I was playing with US Van of Estes and Anton Leonard and those guys that, that all of them had kids and all of them were married. And here comes me that is freshly out of school, um, just writing my final, final exam. So, yeah, it was a surreal moment, but I think it was the the seed was planted very early in my life. Well, I mean, yeah, thanks for. I mean, you mentioned quite a few things that I that I want to ask you about, and one of them is, I mean, did you have any other sports interest? And you mentioned cricket. Um, how how did you do at cricket, and what what 
I mean, as a batsman, were you a bowler? Yeah, I was. <laughs> I was a batsman, um, but I, I bowled a little bit. I, I was. As, I started out as a spinner, and then like small, like Auntie Cornelia, small, uh, slow, medium um, pace bowler that um, does eat the length um, quite often. So, yeah, it was. And I did play tennis as well. But I think one of the the things is why I love cricket. It's you are still individual, but it's a team sport. And tennis, I think, was the thing that I least enjoy even that i had provincial colors in in both cricket and tennis but it was uh, one of those sports we were are individual and rugby is like a team sport you need to trust the guy next to you and obviously the memories you make is not only yourself um it's a whole team and like even today when we come together um and you talk about it you can still reminisce about um what good times you had especially at loftus Tell me, um, as a youngster, I mean, before we get to your 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 actual professional career, um, you were you grew up in the in you know in the Western Cape. So, is it fair to say you were a Western Province Stormers supporter? I was, but um, like my dad said, everybody asked him, "Yeah, isn't it tough now that Derek is playing for the Bulls and?" And who are you going to support? Are you going to support Western Province or the Blue Bulls? And he said, well, I'm actually, I grew up in the Boerland, so I'm a Boerland and not a Western Province guy. So okay. I think I went, I went and and it was a tough decision. Um, when I left school, I, um, Jan Swartz was, he was the guy that did the scouting for for uh, for the Bulls at that stage. Um, we built up a very good relationship, especially in my last year at school. And it, the reason why it was a tough decision I wanted to stay in the Cape. Um, all my friends were there. Um, I still had a girlfriend at that stage. So I, I really, I left everything behind. And one of the things that happened at school, I had a lot of back pain and and the girl, my mother and father took me to the doctor and there was something wrong with my disc in my back. And, and he was laughing at me and say, well, you must keep playing rugby. And um, and obviously train hard because it will help you later in your life. And with the smirk on his face, he said, well, you're not going to play for the Springboks. That's the only downfall. And I went back to the hospital. Well, I, I literally it took me half an hour for my dad to get me out of the toilet because I was crying like you can't believe. And um, I went back to the hospital and to put on my... My trainers and I just went about things like I usually do. And that night in bed, I just decided, but I need to, to become a Springbok very early in, in my career. So I don't have a lot of time left. And as I spoke to the guys of Western Province, they almost had that same laughing in my face, basically, when I wow. asked them, if I'm good enough, will I play for the senior team? And they said, no, 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 we are going to take you through the ranks. And when I met with Heineke Meyer and Ian Swartz, I said, well, if you're good enough, we'll, we'll select you. And I think um, yeah, the things happened quite quite early in my career. So I don't yeah. think it was a bad decision. And obviously, and the rest is history. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone, um, I, I posted um, a tweet today just asking people to, to send me some questions. And a guy, Flores um, Bellingham, came up with a very interesting question and you kind of touched on it now. And that's why I asked you about who you supported. And he just wanted to know, did you ever, when you came to the Bulls, being a, a Western Province supporter, obviously, but then you came to the Bulls, did you ever long like, or thought, yes, I, I, I wish I actually did play for Western Province? Or did it just completely switch? No, I mean, I look, your career is over. You don't have yeah, to no really fire you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's the nice thing, and and obviously one of my faults probably is sometimes I'm too honest. Um, so I will I will answer the question quite honestly as well. And I think because rugby, and when I started in 2002, the reality is well, the end of 2001. As a professionals, we were still young. We only got yeah. been professional in '96, I, re, I think. Um, so, and I think the thing about rugby is um, when you get into a team. Um, and it's guy that you enjoy playing with and guys that you respect. Um, you always talk about the Bulls and Western Province and the Jersey, etc. And and sometimes yeah. I think the unions portray it like, yes, you have to respect the Jersey. But I, I honestly believe it's it's the guy in the Jersey that makes the union special. And if you look back now, we weren't 
nobody was household names when we started, but um, we had a very good era. Um, one thing that I won't change for anything in the world. And now you have Gary Boeta and Donnie Rousseau and Victor Matfield and Frida Priya, Yes, one of their stays and Etan Boeta, Frida Priya, you're on route and you can carry on. So I think it was one of those, those decisions, which was a tough one. Um, if I had it my way, probably I would have stayed in, in Cape, Cape Town, but there, there wasn't really a choice for me after meeting with Heineke and, and getting an opportunity to join the seniors. Yeah. And um, as a, a, again, just sorry, we're going to go to your career now, but um, as a child, in your childhood, who did you look up to? Who was, who was your heroes? Yeah, I get I get that question quite a lot, and and it's the weird thing when you grow up in a rugby mad country that there must be somebody that you look up to. And I didn't really have any heroes per se that I really looked up to. There's uh, teams that I think the Stormers in the late '90s, 2000 was a team that was was nice to watch. But the one guy that I I looked up to was Andrew Bad. I just think he, he played the game. Um, in such a matter, matter that he always looked like he had probably five minutes more than the normal rugby player. And especially yeah. his personality off the field was something that I aspired to. And, and when I started, I always thought to myself that you know, when I start playing rugby, I want to be a better person the day I finish and the day I started. And I think Andre Bear, he, um, he portrayed that for me. And one other guy was was Carlos Spencer, and I played a lot against him. But you might laugh when when I was at Bolan Lanto and at school and Crane Week, I, I hate kicking. So now people will look at you as a kicking fly off, and it was just a game plan that we we adapted. And Heineke was he was he was thinking far ahead. I think now now teams have caught up to up to the Bulls, but at that stage we realised that turnovers is what the most tries come from, and we did play team and rugby, but if you win, the, if you have a score 92-3 against the Reds, you can't say that we played team and rugby. No chance, no chance at all. Um, in 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 um, in your playing career, you you were lucky enough to. I mean, obviously, you played at, at all the venues in South Africa. You were a Springbok. You got to travel a little bit with the Springboks, and then um, eventually you went overseas. So you, you know, you played in Europe as well. And which brings me to my question: um, of all the venues that you played at, which one is the one that you enjoyed the most, and why? And if there was one venue that you did not play at, which venue is that that you would have loved to play at? Well, I was blessed and lucky. Luckily enough. Um while I was obviously in South Africa, there's nothing that will beat a, a full of this Versfeld, and especially um, when 60,000 people sing a song. So that was that that will always be a special ground for me. Um, Alice Park is one of those venues that you have there. You, almost when you walk down that tunnel, you have that feeling of the the 1995 uh, Springbok guys and and newlands had something special about it because you you can almost smell where they brew their brew the beer so every time <laughs> you go you, you, you can go in close with your eyes closed and you know that you have newlands and and king's park then again the the not the main pavilion the the east pavilion or whatever yeah, they yeah. call it the people are literally sitting on top of you so when they're in full voice it's very intimidating um, and obviously, when my final game, when I when I tore my Achilles or ruptured my Achilles, was at Wembley Stadium. And even if I look back now, that's not a bad stadium to to play your mm -hmm. last game. Um, and the other one that was quite special is um, Cardiff Arms Park. I think they changed it now to the Millennium Stadium or whatever. So, yeah. and there was Murrayfield. And so I was quite lucky enough to to play. At all these stadiums, and there's no no other stadium that I can think of at the top of my head that I would like would have loved to play at. Um, so now let's get into the meat of everything. Um, um, I want to ask you about um, the 2002 Curry Cup final. I mean, you were 19 years old, um, and you're in a in, you're in a Curry Cup final. It's your first ever. It's your first season as a professional 
in a, in a in one of the biggest teams in the country and you in the carry cup final against strong well the lions or whatever they were called and um, and yeah i mean you broke a record that day 26 points that you scored on your own breaking the record of nas puerta um and uh, Brom van Straten at that stage had the record of 24 points in a Curry Cup final. And I mean, you went and smashed the two, what was it, two drop goals, something like five penalties and a try. Uh, funny enough is you missed both tries that were scored in that game. That's actually, I went, I watched it today and I was like, wow, how did that happen? Because <laughs> the final yeah. score was 31, whatever, for the Lions. But I mean, that day... That day put you on the mark. And I mean, that's the day that I was like, this is, yeah. I never, ever thought of the Nas Berta, to be honest with you. I was a big Nas Berta fan. And the day, that day when I saw you play, I was, I was sold. I mean, Nas wasn't playing anymore. And he has this 19-year-old um, boy, if you, if you don't mind me calling you that. Not, and, not at all. And I was just, yeah, I mean, it was amazing. I actually had a chat to another guy. I see he's on the chat today. And um, and I told him a story that whenever I went to Loftus, uh, we always sat on the East Pavilion, which is the best pavilion at Loftus. And okay. um, and I always had this this thing that I shouted. It's like Nas's boss, of Nas was boss, but Derek is Koenig. I tell you what, <laughs> you, you heard that, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I love Nos Puerta and I, I was fortunate enough to meet him. But and, um, I tell you what, today is a very special day for me, even though it's we're meeting across the screen. But just to sit and chat with you is really a, an honor. But if you can take us through that day, I mean, just how was it for you? I mean, it, something like that's unheard of. Your first ever Curry Cup final in your first season and you got break the Curry Cup final record, almost scoring all the points yourself. Yeah, I think, first of all, thanks for that compliment. Even if uh, somebody mentioned your name in the same sentence as Nas Goethe, it's a, it's a massive compliment. I just think when you're 19 years old, it's one of those things that you, you're fearless and you don't think about the repercussions of what you're doing on the field and you just want to be out there and play. And when you get older, you think about, and when I mean, life happens, you think that, yes, I need to pay this bill, I need to do this, and I can't miss this kick, and this is what I want to achieve in my career. And then you start thinking, and you, you start thinking yourself out of that that special thing you have as a youngster. Um, on that day, it was, first of all, nobody expected us to be in the final. Um, we played the Sharks away um, in the rain, which we won in the last minute. Um, and we played the Lions against all odds at, um, at Ellis Park. And and it was those days, I think three schools that yeah. day were phenomenal. And he got us on the front foot every time. And I and I always joke when I don't didn't know what to do myself, I just pass the ball to Dries and he gets you on the front foot. Um, yeah, and I don't think and, and guys like Dries and I think Jakob van der Beste in that game was also phenomenal playing at fullback. If you look back, sometimes he carries the ball in tackle, there's a turnover, they kick the ball, and then Jakob van der Beest is under the ball as well. So there was a lot of unsung heroes in that game. So like I said, rugby is a, is a team sport. And at that day, just one of those days that you don't feel like you can um, do anything wrong except for that two conversions. And I think I was just tired <laughs> to kick the ball. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so, oh, wow. that is amazing. Yeah, but I mean, what a day! What a day for rugby it was. I mean, I, I watching it to, um, earlier today. I, they, I found a clip on YouTube. It was a 14-minute clip, and just seeing that massive crowd. Um, yeah, it must have been surreal for you as such a young person. And I mean, as you mentioned, three scores. Yeah, he was phenomenal in that game, and also um, Jakub van der Westhuizen stood out quite a lot just in that 14-minute clip that I saw. It's spot on what you just said there. But, I mean, in all fairness, I mean, breaking a Curry Cup final record at the age of 19, that which was standing at that stage for 15 years, you know, I think you 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 did deserve the man of the match at the end of the day. Well, um, I, think, I think I was a little bit blessed as well, just to, sorry to interrupt, but no. if, you, if you look back, um, the last penalty was a scrum penalty and we were probably ahead by a long way. And I didn't really realise that, 
what the record was. So somebody made the call that we're going for post. So I don't know who I need to thank for that. But um, yeah, so it was one of those days that, that and, and it's sad, like you're talking about that crowd and the flags and everything. And I think that is a sad thing about the state of our rugby. Even we won the yeah. World Cup, everybody's in good spirits, but you, you haven't seen a crowd like week in and week out that go to Loftus and pack it with 60,000 people. And the same with Ellis Park. So that is, um, that is one of the things that I think that especially the ex-rugby players would like to see um, people filling the stadiums and really support the guys because they need your support. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's very true. I agree 100% there. Um, then next, um, what we were 2002, and then suddenly 2003 came about, and and as you mentioned earlier, you were told you were never gonna, you were, you will never be a Springbok, and I mean two years into your career, and suddenly you're on your way to a, a, a rugby World Cup. Before I get to the World Cup, just tell us about the day that you found out that you're going to become a Springbok. What yes, happened? That is, how did you, how did you find is, out? That is, uh, I wish I could tell you a better story, or, but it's it's probably one of the biggest regrets I have. And luckily, you didn't ask the, the story of Kamstaldrat. So let's keep past <laughs> that. Um, so it was one of those. We didn't know literally before half an hour before the team was announced. So Rudolf Strauli wow. kept everything under wraps. So there was, I think we were probably 30, 32 guys in the squad. And um, the last 26 was 26, 28 guys was announced at Tickies with Elsie, Elsie de Villiers. And there was, they had this big thing where the bus drove through the wall. The and bus everybody drove got through the wall, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and it was packed, and you couldn't even see around you. And I think, I think whenever somebody becomes a Springbok for the first time, doesn't matter where, what, whatever. I think a coach should send them home or fly their parents up because that is one of the most special nights that you will have in your rugby career. Um, and I literally, I spoke to my mother and father. And then the next thing I know, I was blindfolded going to come stall drive. So, and I was literally laying in the bush and thinking to myself, you know what? I don't know if becoming a Springbok, this is what it's all about. I don't really know if it's worth it. Um, yeah. And when we got back from come stall drive, they had like 780 missed calls and 700 SMSs and WhatsApps or mix it or whatever it was those days. And I couldn't speak to somebody. So, and and I think that is that is that's probably the 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 thing that I regret most that you didn't have that special moment of becoming a Springbok for the first time and enjoying it with your friends and and your mother yeah. and father and your family. Yo, yeah, that is amazing, shucks, man. Sorry, to, I didn't expect to hear that kind of story at all. But yeah. Um, anyway, so you survived Comstaldra, thankfully. Most of it, all, oh, all of you did, and. Um, <laughs> And then, I mean, you guys were on your way to the World Cup and you were selected um, to my biggest disappointment behind Louis Kuhn. And um, it was only a matter of time. I think you started two games off the bench and the rest of the World Cup, you ended up starting as the, you know, the, the, the first choice fly-off. Um, in that... There's only one thing to talk about, really, in that World Cup, and that was the famous tackle, you know, that you had to, you were the lucky one that had to face or get hit by Brian Lima, of all guys. Yeah, yeah. And I know the story has been told till death and everything, but, um, you know, just, I mean, how was it? I mean, was it sore? Did you, did you even think you were going to get up? What made you get up? Well, I, I think to, to to start at the beginning, um, I think I will I will never be one of those guys that said I was selected too early or too young. Um, I just think the probably my first big game was against the All Blacks in a quarter final, um, and that's probably one of the things that you would like to have a running have like ten or fifteen tests because before you go into to knock out rugby, but then coming to to um, to Brian Lima, um, yeah, obviously. I get that question quite a lot. Um, I think he's probably the guy that he tackled us into history books. 
he, he, he basically <laughs> tackles both famous. So wherever you go, if it's Fiji or New Zealand or somebody, everybody um, remembers that tackle. And uh, so <laughs> I, I did it. Well, when he hit me, I thought to myself, I'm not getting up from this. It felt like something was broken. And Uli Smith just ran up and he didn't even ask me. And he was on the on the radio to um, Rural Australia and said, we need to get Derek off, get Louis back on the field, blah, blah, blah. And it took me like a minute to actually explain to him. I said, I'm all right. I'm just winded. So I couldn't speak. So, and, and luckily enough for me, the game went out for a, a couple of phases after that. So I could yeah. actually pick myself up from, from the floor. And I, and I think that was almost a defining moment in my career where there's that perception or stigma around the player. And I think I got the respect of the players next to me for standing up and continue playing because it's easy enough when you're leading just to, to throw in the towel. Um, and afterwards, I was joking with the guys, like my old jersey was wet, but where Brian Lima, where he hit me, it was dry. There was no sweat on in the middle of my... So I think I'm still feeling it today. Um, oh, wow. The next morning wasn't fun. So, uh, but uh, yeah, so it's all part of the game and, and things like, like that happen. Um, I went up to US after the tackle and I said, please just keep the passes a little bit lower. Yeah, and he was, so mad at, he was so mad at me and I said, yes, you must be joking me. I just almost got decapitated and you mad at me. And one of the special things when, when US obviously he got sick and I went to visit him a couple of times and yeah. the one day I came there and he said, no, you got a present for me. And all these trips that he did for J9 Foundation, he had a Brian Lima jersey that he got for me. So he gave me the Brian <laughs> Lima jersey and said, uh, I'm sorry for that pass. Well, it was 10 years later. But um, yeah, that was a special moment and that's a jersey that I will, I will cherish. And, and I think Brian Lima still owe me a couple of beers. I was going to actually ask you, have you and Brian ever spoken um, about it or have you ever spoken? Well, I couldn't speak after the game, but um, so we haven't uh, haven't actually, we, there's, a, there's a guy that's writing a book. So we're talking about each other, but we haven't really um, met each other face to face. And I think that will be quite a nice thing if we maybe in time, in the time that is still left that we, um, meet up and had a couple of beers he obviously he said in the book that he will buy me a beer and he would like to to talk <laughs> about that tackle. and he said that it's probably the, the the biggest tackle that he um gave in his in his rugby career um interesting enough uh, just going back to that 2002 final and and i'm sure you might recall this uh, but when i watched it today i mean there was an incident in that game that curry cup final where you got smashed as well um, yeah. and late. And Jonathan Kaplan said, no, it looked fine too from where he was. I mean, that was unbelievable. When I watched it today, I thought that would have been a, a that would have been a yellow, if not a red, in today's game. I mean, that's crazy. Well, yeah, if it was it was today, and we have a Saracens group that uh, all the guys have played for Saracens, and and it was like the last week, actually, ironically. They, they posted a lot of photos of themselves being tackled and they said, well, today's game, it will probably be a red card. Um, and I, I think it was Jacques Fourie that, um, or no, it was Yuri Miller that hit me late. Yes, um, Yuri, that's right. Yeah, and I, I don't think we, I don't know where Kaplan was, but I think one of the special things after that, it was like, almost like US was worried and he played the ref a little bit after that. And yeah. I think just having the confidence of... Uh, iconic star that backs you up in the game obviously does lift your confidence a lot yes yeah, see oh uh, well i mean i'm glad you survived it so yeah and i hope you get that beer from brian that would be really yeah, i think oh, yeah. you guys oh, yeah. will have a good laugh about all of that um then we uh um, moving on to 2007 i mean we know i mean that was just a year of amazing things especially, if, uh, you know, for the Bulls. I mean, South Africa winning the World Cup as well. But the precursor to all of that was the Super Rugby, the Super Rugby season. And, I mean, I was um, I was fortunate enough to be at that Reds game that you mentioned earlier today, you know, where you guys, what was it, 93-3 or something that you won. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've read a lot of stories about that 
what is your personal encounter of that that match? I mean, you guys had to win by 70 odd something points to try and qualify, and you ended up winning, as we know, I think it was 93 somewhere there. What was your uh, what is your recollection of of what Heineke told you guys, and how what did you guys do on the field just to do that? Because I mean, it, nobody I think backed you at all. Not even the you know, not even the Bulls faithful. I mean, I was at that match. Yeah, I think um, it was, that, that's probably one of the biggest lessons I've learned in my life. And normally when, before we have a captain practice, we have the auditorium where we go through the game plan and obviously going through defense and our attack and et cetera, et cetera. And all our players were chatting amongst each other and saying, well, if we beat the Reds, and get four points, we'll go to Durban and we play the Sharks and we can win them and in the final anything can happen. And I think it was a massive journey for us. We didn't we didn't win the Super Rugby in 2007. It was literally a journey from 2002 um, mm. that we started and obviously that was that was the end goal. Yeah. Um, and that was a that was a talk amongst each other and Heineke Meyer walked into the auditorium and he said, well, we're going for the 76 points and it's a point difference. So, and ironically, the first point in that game was the Reds um, kicked the penalty. And after that, they didn't get any more points. But looking back at that night before the game, um, Heineke told us a story and, and, and I will just like quickly touch on it. Um, yeah. Obviously, probably adapted it a little bit, but it was a story about the Bulls that um, there was no water and there was no food and obviously they all are going to die but the the land of milk and honey is just around the mountain whatever but to get there there's lions and there's crocodiles and 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 tigers and all those covered type of things and one day the captain of the bull decided but we need to take the chance because we're going to die um, and there was this little bull that just ran ran and the people or the animals next to the road said well it's impossible you can't do it you can't do it um, and then they stopped running but this little bull just kept on running um, and long story short they made it past the crocodiles and the lions and and the leopards and everything and around the mountain um, and he made it into the land of Mokanani it's exactly what they said enough water enough food and they have wanted to have an interview with um, this little bull, and they realized that the bull was death. So that was that was his message to us. He said, if people tell you what you're going to do or what you're going to fail at, that's probably going to happen. And if your mindset is right, um, you, you you we can do it. And he went through the whole team. He said, well, PSP, you have to score three times tries. Brian Abana, you have to score three times. Derek, you have to kick 85% plus. And so he went through every little play and every guy bought into that. And the most amazing thing is, as he continued his team talk, you can feel like some of the players were making it to the edge of the chair. So you can feel like everybody is starting believing in, in what yeah. he wants us to accomplish. And that the night on my way up home, I spoke to my dad and I said, no, we're going for the 76 points. And he said, and you can hear when somebody feels like he wants to say, but it's super rugby, it's unheard of. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. happen. Um, and after the game, I phoned him and he said, he just said, well, no, I won't say anything in my life again. So it was, <laughs> it was a special moment. And, and I think when, when the crowd realized that we can actually make it, um, I reckon for the last 30 minutes of that game, the whole of this first felt were standing on their feet. Um, yeah. And it was a game that we won 92-3. And they literally pushed us over the line. And um, and even talking about it now, it was goosebumps. And when I played at Leicester Tigers, it was Aaron Major. And I think that is where the, the biggest thing came about. He said, nobody thought that it was going to happen. And everybody needed to keep their phones on. And they got a text. Everybody was sleeping. And they got a text, um, well, we don't have a semi-final in Christchurch anymore. We're going to South Africa. We're playing the Bulls at Loftus. And they had to pack and make their way to the airport. And I think that was the defining moment of that uh, old Super Rugby. Yeah. And then, um, and then they came to Loftus, as you just mentioned. And you rocked up and you decided to score all 27 points in the semi-final against the Crusaders of all people that included... 
the likes of Dan Carter. I mean, uh, and never, I mean, you just mentioned Aaron Major. I mean, yeah, the names, anybody knows the Crusaders are always, that's basically almost like the, like the All Black team. All Black side, um, yeah. Just briefly take us through that night. I mean, how did, I mean, was it just a matter of everything just clicking or was it, or were you guys still on a high from what happened the week before? I, I just think maybe it's confidence, um, like you said, maybe from the week before. But I think it was for everybody, it was that journey that uh, we started in 2001, 2002. And it, I, it all came down to to probably two games to to achieve that, um, yeah. and, and and playing against the Crusaders as a side like that, um, obviously like you mentioned, Richie McCaw and Dan Carter, that's guys that can win wherever they play in the world, even if yeah. they don't sleep for a week. Um, so it was it was a tough game, and I, um, it was it was that surreal, and and I think personally for me, after two thousand three, after the the World Cup and after comes Stahl Drought and after the Curry Cup to to on the be probably the biggest provincial stage to 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 play the rugby that I know I could play was for me personally it was it was a good night but we as a team just was was so solid and at one stage I we literally felt like we can't lose that Loftus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very, very true. Um just an interesting fact on that. I mean you equaled you actually equaled the record for a Super Rugby um, semi-final, which was held since 1998. I didn't, unfortunately, put the gentleman's name down, but he played for Auckland. Um, but that was interesting. 27 points that you scored, and which was all the points, basically. Um, yeah. And then, and then, I mean, just to, just to tell you my story on that side, I mean, I was at the Reds game. You guys smashed them, and suddenly, yeah, we're in the semi-final at Loftus. Which I just, um, I can't remember the reason really why, because I was living in Pretoria. Um, but I decided, you know what? I'm not going to go to the semi final. Um, I, I mean, it was like you guys. I mean, just had belief we are going to go to the final. There's no doubt mm -hmm. about it. And I was sitting at home watching that game, literally waiting for the final whistle to go and to try and see where I can get tickets for the final. Because obviously, living in Pretoria, the final being in Durban, you know, the, the Sharks are going to get most of the tickets. So if, you get, if you're going to get lucky, you're going you're gonna to be very, very lucky. And fortunately, my parents lived in Peter Maritzburg at that stage. And Monday morning, um, I was sitting throughout Sunday night um, just scouring the internet. Um, and, and it wasn't like it is today. And, but I found out that in Peter Maritzburg, they were going to sell about 1,000 tickets. And all I did was tell my dad, you got to be there at, I can't remember what the time was, but you got to be there and, uh, yeah, just make it happen. And the rest, we'll make sure we get to Durban somehow, but we're coming to the final. And that's what happened. We all went to the final. And, I mean, what a story. That was one crazy game. Um, yeah, the, I mean, everything, The I mean, the Sharks basically had it. Uh, the, it's, you know, it's, it would be interesting to speak to the likes of Franz Stein and those Oaks to ask them what happened in those last few minutes, you know, when they had the ball and they kicked it downfield of all things instead of just kicking it out. I mean, nothing stopped them from doing it. Um, but for somehow, fate was on, on the Bulls' side and it just somehow happened and played into your hands. I mean, I remember when Albert van der Berg scored that try in the corner and then, I mean, what was the points difference was six. And my, uh, my wife, well, my wife now, she was my girlfriend at that stage. Um, it was her and me and um, my, my parents. And they, my parents, funny enough, they, they shock supporters. And um, she turned to me and she said, what now? And I said, you know what? The way this game has been going, it's, it's not going to happen. It's, it's, there's not enough time. And, um, yeah, you know, it's one of those things. We, we need seven points. That's a converted try. And then, yeah, a miracle happened. I mean, take us through that last few seconds. Yeah, it, feel, it feels like yesterday. Um, wow. And somebody posted it on, um, on, on Facebook a couple of times, and I still get nervous, and I, and I know the result. Um, 
and when when Albert van der Berg scored that try, I th I still remember Gary Boerta dropped to his knees and his head just went. Um, and it was one of those things that we thought to ourselves, well, if they kick this goal, um, there's not enough time to make it back. And it brings us back to that little word, belief. Um, and I think we all had the belief. And Victor Matfield has told us in, in similar words like this. He said, if he misses his kick, we're still going to win this game. Um, and even if you watch that last six, seven minutes um, before Brian scored the try, it was Derek Keane that won the ball back on the ground. It was just crazy. Franz Stein didn't kick the ball out, which he could have done, and the game would have been over. Uh, Jaco Ingels had a flip pass behind his back. Um, yeah. Akona Ndani had a flip pass. So it was like... And and I think that the whole skill set of the Bulls actually came out in that last eight minutes because... We weren't in that game for 72 minutes and we yeah. still managed to wait to win it. Um, and I think that's just a sign of a team that um, believe in each other and obviously have been together for, for a long time. Yeah, so that was amazing. I just saw now someone actually asked me and it's a gentleman from, from Japan, funny enough, who's a big Springbok and Bulls fan, all the way from Japan, Nogals. And he, he yeah. actually went in and I, and I see um, Quentin van Eisten also asking the same question. What was your most memorable moment as a Springbok or Bulls player? Because you had so many. Yeah, I think it's it's one of those difficult difficult questions to really answer because after you answer it tomorrow, you're going to feel like if, I'm, if I should have mentioned that, I should have mentioned that. And I think every era goes through a top type of memories you have and with the spring box you will have good memories and with the bulls you have good memories and and even in the curry cup you have memories to really lift out one um is a difficult is a difficult task but i think winning the super rugby being the first south african team to to win the super rugby um and obviously the curry cup final in 2002 was quite a special one and then the crusader semi-final that you touch on was was the, the class players that we played against was mm. was a very memorable night, um, but obviously there was there was a, a couple of and I, I just wanted to touch on this because when Brian Abana scored that try, and I will never forget it. There was there was a photo taken from from on top of the stadium and and there was fourteen guys with their hands in the air and one guy walking with his head down because I still had to take that kick. So whenever yeah. somebody asked me what was the most pressure you ever felt in a game, it was it was that. It was a, I've seen guys that miss that kick like that, Johnny Wilkerson, yeah. Dan Card. It just sometimes happened. And even if you think that well, literally our destiny is one kick away and you just try to block out your, your mind completely. Um, yeah. and just just be in the moment and yeah, I'm grateful that um, that it was over. Yeah, I mean, and the, the 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 interesting thing about it is, half the Sharks team stormed up, you know, stormed at you, um, you know, when you wanted to take the kick, and then thankfully the ref told them, no, 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 they got to move away, and you, and as you went for the kick, one of them still had the audacity to try and block it, and it went through, and then yeah, I mean, for me, I was in tears at that moment, and I mean, yeah, the rest is history. It was the most unbelievable thing. And um, I just want to show you, I mean, you obviously know this, but they brought out a, a limited edition of um, of um, jerseys, golden jerseys. Yeah. Um, I've just got to get it right now. And um, yeah. I've got a certificate with it and everything. And I, it was the week after the final, um, or, you know, after that weekend, um, I actually went and I gave this to Jan van Graan. Um, sorry, I'm just going to put the screen like this so that, you know, we can see it. And I got all the guys that scored in that match. In, you know, there's you, Brian Abana, Pierre Spies, and obviously the coach, Heineke Meyer. And, and Brian wrote good. that on job, best events. Um, I must say, in all, of all my memorabilia pieces that I have, I mean, uh, you can see there in the background, there's also some Bulls jerseys and stuff. Yeah. Um, that Mr. Price jersey. Uh, on that side is um, is actually signed by U.S. You know when he was already sick, so I mean I've got some very prized possessions, but that jersey, one of a kind, 
Um, I can say that with confidence, and I specifically wanted those guys to sign it. And um, yeah, it was sad that I couldn't be there. You know, when I mean to to you know to be there when you guys signed. But yeah, it's nice just chatting to you about it now today and yeah, and really I'm just one, of the, one of the funniest stories that everybody always asks what happening like off the field stuff and. And there was one of Johan Roots's um, best friends. He got married on the final. So I don't know why he decided to get married oh. on the final after Super Rugby. Um, but um, so they had screens up, and they and in the last three minutes, the screens went. The, the power was cut, oh, and no. all the shark and all the shark supporters at the wedding was they were happy and they were drinking <laughs> and they were celebrating. And then he phoned Johan Roots after the game and he said, yes, but buddy, sorry um, that you lost the game. He said, what are you talking about? We won. So he went back into the, with the wedding and he said, no, the Bulls won. And so everything changed. The Bulls was celebrating and the Sharks was <laughs> was a bit sad. So I myself, yeah. that, is a, that is a priceless, priceless story. Yes, yeah. I tell you what, I've heard, I've heard some very similar stories myself from that final. I tell you, I think um, if you had to sit down or send out something and get people to try and write about that day, you're going to end up getting thousands of stories, um, you know, like that. I mean, I actually know of pool supporters that were at the stadium that bet shark supporters that were sitting next to them, something like a thousand mm -hmm. rand or something. And then um, when that final, when, when Albert van der Berg scored, the Bulls guys actually left. So the the sharks guy ended up walking away with the money, but he lost the bet. So yeah, that was that was a ridiculous story that I had. And I, I, yeah, shame. I feel for those poor guys. Anyway, I mean that was that. I mean that was sort of you know, the end of you know the um, I mean the World Cup happened after you know that season and everything. And then in two thousand and eight, firstly Heineke Meyer left. Who it's a is a coach that I have adored so much, and they were. You know, and then the day came that he left Loftus, which was very, very sad. But what was even worse was the day that he got you to leave as well. I mean, that was just gut-wrenching stuff for me to see, you know, um, my favorite player of all time, you know, leaving my favorite team and going overseas. I mean, those days we weren't seeing overseas rugby at all. So that to me was like, I'm never, ever going to see you play again. And um, yeah, you ended up going to Leicester Tigers and you were there briefly. Just, um, you know, we all know what happened after that. And soon after you got to Leicester, then Heineke had to come back for personal reasons and stuff. Did you have any regrets at that stage? Like, ah, maybe I should have just stuck it out at Loftus? I did at that moment because um, when I, Heineke signed with Leicester Tigers, he, he told me that one of the guys that he wanted to sign first and he needed at the club was myself. And I think... That's where loyalty, um, and yeah. there's a lot of time when Heineke said that he wants to go overseas and build a dynasty and all this chat. And, and it's easy with words to just say it, but it's difficult when you have to make the decision. And I was still in a, in a four-year contract with the Bulls, and I yeah. told him that, well, if you can get me out of the contract, then obviously, like we've always spoken about, I'll, I will go with you. And like you said, a couple of months later, he was, um, for personal reasons, he came back to South Africa. So I did felt a little bit let down, um, especially, um, and after that, um, well, the first one that was Ismail Dolly was in the Springbok squad, and, and then Mona Stein was, um, he, he, he became a Springbok. So there was, there was regrets. Um, probably one of my biggest regrets that I couldn't play more games for my country. And I think yeah. until the day I die, it will be the same. Um, so I did have regrets at that stage, but I had the opportunity to come back to South Africa. But I just thought to myself, and I, th I think I, I learned it when I went to the hostel and, and being in a hostel environment and, and stuff like that, that the guys can't have respect for me if the coach leave and I leave with them. And yes. obviously I made a lot of good mates at Lisa Tiger. So... I decided to stick out the the season, and we played in the Heineken Cup final that year. Um, so that was a that was a really nice experience because of, with the Heineken Cup, you will either be in Murrayfield, Cardiff, doesn't matter who played in the final. So all yeah. the supporters, 
flock to, to one stadium and outside of the hotel, it's just chaos. So it was a good experience. And, and then I thought to myself, after that season, um, I spoke, spoke to Cockers and with the salary cap, um, there's a couple of guys that they would have lost. Um, and I just said, listen, but I will help you out um, if I, I was in a three-year contract. I will go back to South Africa and then you can keep a lot of your guys in the, in the salary cap. Um, and then Brenda Fenter and Edward Griffiths phoned me um, and they wanted me to, to join up with Saracens. Um, yes. and, and I think that was, that was also a great experience. I think with Nigel Ray, Johan Rupert and Dominic Sylvester, the guys that was involved, they care much more about our families and enjoying rugby than they did about winning games. Um, and oh, I wow. think with Robert and um, Adam Chibad and Neil de Kock and Brad Barrett, um, I think our work ethic just left up a gear. Um, and the first year we, we lost in the Premiership final, the next year we won it. Um, they recently won the European Challenge like two years in a row. Um, mm. That's a massive achievement, um, especially in Europe. So being yeah. part of it, um, if I look back now, even if I have regrets, if I look back now, it's probably one of the best things personally that could have happened to me because we go from Pretoria, which is this, or South Africa, which is this, you have friends all over the world. And you played with guys from Fiji, Tonga, um, yeah. New Zealand, Australia. Um, I was lucky enough to play. And I think it's not always good to play with a, with a good good scrum off because sometimes they become clever and they do everything on their own. But I was lucky enough, I played with Rui Priya. Um, I played with Justin Marshall. Um, I played with yeah. Jason Van So I think everything just aligned quite nicely um, um, at the end. And obviously I had those experiences um, chatting with um, Justin Marshall a lot and we became very good friends. And it just opened up your mind in the way that New Zealand guys are thinking and the ways we yeah. are as Africans are thinking. On that, on that, I mean, you mentioned now, you know, playing with some good scrum offs, and I mean, the names that you mentioned were amazing. Just to add yours to the picture there as well. That's where your when your career started, you played with them, um, yeah. and um, um, that was also something that someone wanted to know: is which scrum off did you enjoy playing with the most, and which one gave you the best passes? <laughs> well, I probably can't say yours. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just joking. Um, I think they were, they were all so different. Um, I think with US Van of Estes, and he was an absolute amazing athlete. Um, and, and funny enough, he wasn't one of the best kickers of the ball. Um, he, was a, he, was a, he was a good passer of the ball. And then in Farida Priya, he had an unbelievable rugby brain. And he probably could, could have kicked... A uh, box kick or behind the scrum better than any fly can five meters back or ten meters wow. back. And Justin Marshall, he was just one of those crazy guys. The last thing in his mind was was um, to kick the ball, um, and they, he just had a different that fighting mentality. So he just loved living life. Um, he didn't train very hard, but when you put him on in the four lines, he was absolutely absolutely amazing. So. And one guy that I think that people don't realize how good he was was Neil de Kock. Yeah. Um, he left for, for Saracens quite early. I really enjoyed yeah. playing with him. He has an absolute brilliant service. And even his kicking was, was probably in Europe second to none. And probably he left South Africa just a year or two too soon. And he would have played a lot more test for South Africa. Um, and I think just his CV, if you look at what he did for Saracens, is. Yep. He's just amazing and he's a household name there and he's a legend. You will yeah. probably walk in there tomorrow and probably they will select him at nine again. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. I was quite I was quite lucky to, to play with him and, and so everybody's got their strengths. Um but it was it, looking back, um I was privileged to, to play with those guys. Yeah. And then um the sixteenth of October two thousand and ten um, if 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 my date is correct, the day that broke not, I think obviously broke your heart the most. But I mean the rest of anybody that was a proper honest supporter of you, um, you know when your Achilles ruptured at Wembley, and yeah, that was like devastating news because I think we all at that stage knew you know of 
of guys like John Smith and that, and you know how it affected their careers and that. And I mean, sadly enough, it, it you know it 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 was the end of your career. Um, you know, you never were able to come back from that. How was that moment when it happened for you? Yeah, I think even today, looking back at it, it was, and not to be naive or anything or be vain about it. I think it was, it was probably one of the the worst things that happened um, for me, especially at that stage. And when when I ruptured my Achilles, it wasn't the fact that I, I thought to myself my career is over. Um, I think the the following five years was was tough for me because I went through three operations. The third one was a proper reconstruction of my foot. With it, with, so they take the toe tendon um, and they drill through the back of your heel and they do a proper reconstruction. Um, so that was probably the most painful operation I've ever had in my life. And at that stage, I was living in London. Um, I was home alone, um, literally fighting that demon. And for four or five years, I did rehab on my foot, trying to make it back. Um, didn't happen. When you start running this hamstring, then there's not a lot, not enough blood flow to your tendon, which you need to 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 heal properly. Um, yeah. And then probably at 33, almost 34 years, I I actually one day in the gym. It was it was one of those moments where I was still training and I was still and just like all the weights just fell out of my hands and I just thought to myself, this is it, my body can't handle it. And and even to, to that day, I thought to myself, I will make it back. But it's just like my soul just completely crashed and I had to make the decision to to properly retire. Um, and Saracens were, were absolutely amazing. They, they supported me all the way. Um, they got me the best treatment and unfortunately, um, it was just, I think my body had enough, um, especially when you started at 18 or 19, the shots you take when, you, when you're young, obviously catch up with you because you can't be as hard as somebody that's 25 or 28 or 30 years old. So, but uh, yeah, so it still makes me sad to talk about it. Um, but you need to, I need to realize that I'm not going to make a comeback now. So I might as well just enjoy watching rugby. It's a lot safer there. <laughs> yeah, I must say, um, I think after that, I mean, all the years, and I mean, there, you, there was a stage that you that you were hoping to come back to the Bulls even, which obviously had me over the moon. And I always said, yes, I wish I can just see Derek Ochoat play one more game, only one more game. That's all I would have wanted to see. Um, I, you know, I had a lot of admiration for for you as a player, and um, and yeah, it's yeah, it's sad as you say. You know, I think um, I'm not the only guy or supporter out there that probably felt the way you know I, I do about you. And I think in general, I think you are a very underrated player from a Springbok perspective. I think you deserve to play way more for the Springboks. Um, I think you were one of the the best players this country's ever had, and it's not just because I'm a, you know, I was a super fan of yours, but I think you were, you know, um, like Nas Puerta. I mean, I saw today some, um, an interesting stat that in in his career, his Curry Cup career, he scored he scored like a hundred and something. I can't remember the exact number now of drop goals. The guy that was that that came second closest to him only scored sixty nine drop goals in his career. I mean, it just, you know, I know a rugby player isn't defined by drop goals or anything, but a fly-off has a certain role. And, I mean, that's what made you and us stand out above the rest is that you could score from anywhere. And, I mean, you did, you had a deadly boot in that final, in that Curry Cup final today. I mean, I noticed when, um, I forgot now it was, I don't know if it was Victor Matfield passed the ball to you and you, I mean, not a standard regular you know, scrum off pass kind of thing. You had to turn around and you slotted a drop goal from quite far out, actually close to the side of the field. So I mean, you know, there's so much, there's so much things that people, you know, that people can say and prove that you know. I think you were you were very underrated, and um, you know, it was an honor watching you as a player. Um, just to off, end off on a lighter note. Um, 
we've got a question here from Quentin van Heistian. He just wants to know, can you share what was one of your funniest moments in rugby where you were involved in? Yeah, I was, um, I can think about one. Obviously, if you give me time, I'll think, think about 20. But yeah. when I was playing at Leicester, there was a, I played with Adam Major, like I, I told you, um, probably one of the best inside centers that uh, New Zealand All Blacks ever had. And we were, we were sitting the one night, he invited me over, we had a couple of beers, Spates obviously sponsored them, sent them beers from New Zealand and went there and one became two and two became four and then I decided, well, I'm not going home tonight. And late night he, he, he asked me, I said, my friend, I always wanted to ask you, what is that? Every time you kick a girl at laughter, there's this song, left wing, left wing. Who's this <laughs> bloody left wing that they are singing about? But I said, no, it's not left wing, it's left lang, which I had to translate to darling. And then he was confused. He said, if I heard 60,000 people sing to another guy, darling. So, and then I had to explain that again. So it was a conversation for probably an hour. So that was, that was quite funny. And, and and even yeah, just yeah, coming yeah. yeah, Kubis Visa, I actually forgot. Kubis Visa wanted me to ask you to tell us that story. So thanks that that is the one that stood out. I mean, yeah, that is yeah, a great. Even Kubis, yeah, calls me left wing and not left. Yes. Right. So, yes. <laughs> that's yeah. I actually know as well, but I thought I didn't know. Obviously, I thought it was an inside joke. But now yeah. it's uh, yeah now now we all know where it comes from. That's it. Yeah, that's actually quite funny. Um, yeah. Derek, geez, I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, thank you so much for your time. It, yes, see, um, you've uh, I actually tweeted someone today. Uh, my life is made. You know, finally getting the opportunity to speak to Derek Alcott, and um, you know, just sharing sharing some stories with you and. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for, you know, for this time that you were willing to share with me. And um, I really, really appreciate it. And yeah, I hope whatever happens in the future for you, um, it's all just going to be good. And, um, you know, may you be blessed um, beyond recognition. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, um, thanks for all the nice words. Guys like you really make everything worthwhile. Um, and just to end off, drop goal is the only thing that you can't defend just for future fly -offs. That's true. Anyway, Derek, have a nice evening. Stay safe. Wash those hands and look after yourself. I really, really I appreciate it. Thank you for yourself. I appreciate it a lot.